Hello, um, my name is Colby Seelig. I'm a uh, marketing major here with a business communications minor. Um, I'm also on the baseball team here, um, but we've been working diligently with uh, Professor Brazillo, and we are excited to have our first accounting and business club event this evening. Also, by the way, note that the flyer at the parlor entrance and the email sent out by Professor Brazillo um, over the weekend are, is going to be our first ABC business meeting um, by Zoom at 7 p.m. So welcome, everyone, to the fall business lecture series. Initially, we would like to thank Dr. William Lattimore, our president, Aaron Woolley, interim vice president for institutional advancement, as well as any other faculty tonight in their assistance in this event. Without you, we would not be able to afford this uh, educational opportunity. And we are honored and excited to welcome Drs. Kent and Lori Griswold to Chestnut Hill College. Uh, Kent Griswold, who has a PhD and MBA, is a serial entrepreneur whose first enterprise was starting a summer camp at the age of 14. He is the founder and producer of The Wolf Pack, which is a television show that is more humane than the Shark Tank. Uh, Dr. Griswold states the program is educational and entertaining, supports local charities, and inspires businesses to do the same. Additionally, the program is helpful to inspiring athletes or entrepreneurs. As you're entering the parlor and before we begin, the Wolf Pack was also playing up on the screen. Um, he launched Zor Games in 2021 and introduced uh, the game called Wall Street. Wall Street is where the one takes the place of an, an investor trying to beat other investors um, try to, and try to be crowned the king of Wall Street. Dr. Griswold served 20 years as president and CEO of Griswold Home Care, which is a multinational provider of non-medical home care services before it was sold to a private equity firm. The company was founded by Dr. Griswold's mother and is the world's oldest multinational non-medical home care company with over 10,000 professional caregivers working through over 100 offices in the United States, South Korea, and Mexico. Lori Griswold, who also has a PhD and MSG, is nationally known policy analyst, gerontologist, and is an aging issues coach. She serves as a consultant in long-term care and compliance. She has a history of involvement in federal, national, state, and local advocacy and policy organizations. In addition to her experience at Griswold, her past professional career includes roles as a consultant for the Department of Justice, U.S. Attorney's Office, Southeast Pennsylvania Region, and longtime member of the PA Intergovernmental Council on Long-Term Care. Researcher for the National Institute on Aging at UCLA. She has worked for Fortune 500 and government agencies on pre-retirement planning and has authored various articles, book chapters, and grant applications. She recently joined the board of directors of the Jean Griswold Foundation, which is a private charity established by Griswold Home Care to further the company's belief that care for the elderly and disabled should be accessible for all. So these are all very incredible, incredible credentials. So tonight, rather than lecture, the Griswolds have requested that students to ask them questions regarding their opinions and thoughts and expertise on business. So to kick off the question and answer portion, uh, I would like to ask the first question for tonight. So the, 
This is both for Kent and Lori. Um, so what skills did you learn as an undergraduate that helped you as you entered the workforce? First, before we start, there are two very important things happening today that I just want to mention. Uh, one is the Phillies are playing tonight, so we're going to try to keep this fairly short, if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> the second thing, and probably even more important, is it's Professor Rizzolo's birthday today. So happy birthday. So, so, I, so I, think the, I think the question had to do with lessons from undergraduate. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that I did not do well as an undergraduate, and I wish I'd done a lot more of, was getting to spend time with my professors. And one of the great things about Chesnut College is the student-faculty ratio here is really pretty much unmatched. I think it's about nine and a half to one, something like that. Um, I went to Harvard undergrad, and uh, it was a very intimidating place, and the professors uh, I had John Kenneth Galbraith, who is a renowned uh, econ economist, is one of my teachers, and uh, we had a thousand people in our class. Um, so really didn't have much of a chance to get to know him, but I wish I had taken the effort to do, do uh, office hours and, and do that. So I encourage you uh, to get to know each and every one of your professors uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. And for me, I guess one thing that I really um, learned a lot from as an undergrad and then throughout graduate school, and I'd encourage all of you to do it, is take advantage of any internships or just experience that you can get um, either through work or just to actually test out whether what you're doing is something you really want to do. Because I was pre-med as an undergrad, and after my junior, going into my junior year and had realized, yeah, I don't want to be pre-med, but I'd done all the requirements, I'd taken the MCATs, everything, and then I decided, you know, this is just not for me. And my parents were like, excuse me, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't know yet. And at that point, I had a professor who um, was doing research on, back in the 80s, and it's a long time ago, I know, um, on aluminum and if that's a cause for Alzheimer's disease. So I started working with her and I was very close to my grandmother and that's really how I got into the field of aging. And if I hadn't had that relationship with my professor, I don't think I would have um, had that opportunity. So I really encourage you to really branch out and try something different because if you think you know what you want to do and then you get out there and it's not what you want to do, that's okay because then you've actually had the opportunity to test it out. And internships, from my perspective, are a great way of doing that rather than going through all the, all the work and then getting out in the workforce and say, oh, this is what it's like to do this? I don't think so. And so I really encourage you to work with your professors because they can help you um, gain that expertise as well as experiences. Yes, I have a, que I have a question. Um, so what are your guys' top three websites or blogs that you can't imagine like going a day without? And why would they be your top three? I actually don't read any blogs. Um, I don't go to any websites. Um, I get a lot of my news uh, you know, from watching CNN, places like that. Uh, and then I get some feeds in for different things that, I, that I'm interested in. But uh, I'm, very, I'm very passive when it comes to that. So I, I'm really uneducated, sorry. <laughs> for me, I um, am kind of a policy wonk and kind of a nerd, so I um, keep up with a lot of different things through the government, different um, agencies, um, a lot of data. I kind of like data and research, so that's where I get most of mine through NIH as well as um, CDC and other entities that work with the field of aging. I have a question. Should business majors earn an MBA? Or is there another graduate degree you would recommend? And why did you earn an MBA? There's like a really bright light right there. Should business majors earn a, a, an MBA? Or is there another graduate degree? And why did you earn your MBA? Yeah, I, I was also uh, uh, pre-med undergraduate. I did biology and economics as a, as a dual major. Uh, and uh, decided organic chemistry and I were not good friends, so I 
stop the uh, medical route. Um, but uh, I, I had always been interested in business, and uh, economics is a good foundation, I think, for uh, that type of program. Uh, and looking at, at graduate programs, uh, I considered different things, but the MBA uh, seemed to really fit with what I was doing in business. And uh, I, th I think if you're, if you're a business undergrad, you may or may not benefit from an MBA because you've already learned a lot of that. So I think going directly from undergrad right into an MBA, if you're a business major, uh, I would recommend probably working for two or three years in between because when you do your MBA, it's a lot more applied type stuff and having that business uh, experience uh, where you can relate it to what you've done or what you're still doing uh, can be much more helpful. And I think it's a, it's a great credential. I mean, you know, it's just the, the people that you meet in business school, because I went to Harvard undergrad and then Wharton for an MBA, and you meet a very different group of people in the graduate programs. Um, you know, normally when you go on to graduate school, you're very motivated because you're spending your own money, you're spending your own time where you could be working. Uh, and meeting people who have a, a very similar interest. A lot of the undergrads in the business program have similar interests, and you can network with them too, and the same thing if you do go on to an MBA. So keep meeting people. My question is, what is the best career advice you have ever received? Oh, well, we were actually talking about this the other night, and um, neither of us really got a lot of good career advice, so. <laughs> I um, envy the, the experiences that you're having here at Chestnut Hill College because your professors offer so many options for you to talk to them and, and the small class size and everything that you've, that you've got here to, to experience I think is really, um, is really important. I guess my, the, on, the only career advice that I could really, um, I guess, that I remember was when I was in graduate school and my professors were just like, just get it done, just do it. So that Nike, you know, the Nike slogan, just do it. One of my professors actually gave me a poster and put it on the wall and just said, just do it. But for me, I think I really would encourage you to, um, you know, just trust your gut and whatever you feel is um, right for you, then do that because a lot of people are going to tell you what they think is right. It's like, well, this is the path that you should take, and it should be this direct line between A and B. My life was not like that. Mine, you know, started out, like I said, with pre-med, and then it took a lot of different turns, and I had a lot of people telling me at a lot of different, a lot of different times, oh my, because I really had a passion for working with older adults and disabled individuals, and they're like, really? That's what you want to do? You're 18. What are you talking about? And I'm like, well, that's what I want to do. And so I spent a lot of time initially trying to convince people that this is what I wanted to do. And then I just said, I'm not, I'm, this is what I'm doing. Okay, if you like it, great. If not, okay. But I really think that you have to have confidence in yourself. And if you have a passion or a desire to learn something, then that's what you pursue. So I, I thought you might ask that question. So I did a little bit of homework. Um, we did not get a lot of <laughs> career advice, um, but I did make some, some notes I want to share with you. Uh, one is take risks. You know, when, when you're young, it's the opportunity to do it. When you get older, it's a lot harder to take risks. You know, try different industries, try different jobs. If you want to go live overseas and work, do that. Uh, try starting your own company. You know, now's the time to do that. You may think you don't have enough money or you know, resources or experience, but you know, it's okay to do it and fail three, four, or five times. You know, just keep going. Um, Live your own life. Don't worry so much what other people think about you. And I'm including your parents in that too. You know, you got to figure out what, what makes you happy. Uh, the highest paying job is not always the most rewarding. Uh, work harder than the person in the next cubicle. Uh, figure out your passions and find a way to turn them into a job. Don't live beyond your means. Have fun, but try to save and invest as much as you can. Work smarter, not harder. Work on the business, not in it. Don't burn bridges, but don't continue to work in an abusive situation. Don't say, date someone who works for you. Well, actually, Laura used to report to me and we got married, but so make exceptions. Um, spend more time developing your strengths than working on your weaknesses. And that's a critical thing. A lot of people think, okay, I'm great in math, terrible in English, so I'm gonna keep working on English. If you're great in math, keep working on math because that's the only way you're gonna become an expert in your field. And so figure out what you're good at, figure out what you like, and keep getting better and better at that, and someday you'll be that expert in that field. Uh, and then I have this one uh, um, in all caps, network, network, network. 
Try to meet one new person every day and be in touch with one friend or colleague every day. And in three years, you'll meet over 1,000 people. But the people you meet in your life are probably the best resource you can, you can possibly find. You know, talk to your classmates. When you come into class, you might sit down and see somebody you don't really know or you don't talk to. Take a risk. Talk to them. You'll, you'll find out some interesting things about the people you go to school with. And just to follow up on that, um, if you haven't noticed, he's more the extrovert and I'm the introvert. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as an introvert, don't be afraid to um, attempt and do leadership as well, because I think everybody always assumes leaders are people who are very outgoing and, and um, you know, are the extroverts in the room. And I, um, I guess, would disagree with that because to Kent's point about becoming an expert and knowing your subject matter so well, it's basically an innate way of developing your own leadership. And you can do that, I think, um, in a lot of different ways. So I, I guess my um, bottom line is just trust yourself and make sure that you're enjoying what you do because if you enjoy what you do and you have passion for it, it makes all the difference because you'll have jobs throughout your career that just suck. They're just like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. But those are the ones who, that really help you decide what you want to do. And then I think you, you continue to you know, develop to where you want to be. Another question? Um, how would you recommend that a student and young alumni get involved in policy organizations? Um, well, in terms of policy, to Kent's um, comment and the, the other question is networking is really important, but policy comes in a lot of different forms and in a lot of different ways. And for me, um, when I first graduated from college, back to my major, I had a major in psychology and minors in French and biology. So that's the well-rounded pre-med individual, but I decided I wanted to go into the field of aging, so, but I didn't know exactly where. So I worked for a few years for a nursing home corporation, and throughout that experience, I went to the state capitals a lot and was so frustrated because all of the policies that they were writing, they had no idea how those were going to be implemented in a nursing facility or in a hospital or in a healthcare organization. They, they, had, they were well-intentioned, but they had no idea what they were expecting people to do. And I was on the front lines and saying, how do you think this is going to happen? So that's how I really kind of got involved in policy and seeing how the well-intentioned policy writers really had no idea of the real world and how to try to bridge that gap a little bit. So what I would do is on my time off, I would go and just hang out, I know it sounds nerdy, um, at, the state, with the state le at the state legislature and watch how they were developing policies. And I got to know different people on the staff who were then trying to figure out how to write the policies or legislation to match the need. And so for me, it was really back when I was in school, it was more um, things that I had to do on my own. Now there's more organizations and clubs and um, internships and different ways of getting yourself out there to really learn more about policy and the kind of policy that you might want to be involved in. I hope that answers the question. Um, my next one is, how important is networking for a young professional and how would we do it? Well, I think it all depends on the type of person you are. Back to you know, my previous comment, I think um, getting to know your professors and um, doing internships for me was a really important way to network um, because it was really trying to launch me into different arenas. I at one point thought I wanted to do pre-retirement planning. I wanted to get out of healthcare. So I worked for a, um, a company that I did an internship with that did pre-retirement planning for a lot of the Department of Defense and um, government agencies, and I worked with like Gulfstream down in Savannah, Georgia, to try to help people, you know, figure out what they're going to do when they retired. And having that experience just reinforced that I wanted to go back in healthcare. So if I hadn't networked and figured out who I could um, talk to and figure out different opportunities, I never would have known what what the what they were. I think the informational interview is a great way to do networking. Um, you might think that the you know, CEO or the CFO or somebody of a company 
has no interest in talking to you because you're just a student. And if you call them up and say, I'd like to come and interview, interview for a job, they'll say, well, why don't you talk to HR or somebody else about that? But if you say, I've, I've read a bit about your background, and I, I want to really find out you know, how you've made a difference with this company and how you got to where you are as CEO of the company or CFO or whatever it might be. And you do have to do a little research to know a bit about them when you do that call. But you'd be amazed at the number of top executives that will take the time to meet with you for 20 minutes or even a half hour uh, and talk about their background. And it's amazing how you can then leverage that into an actual job interview or internship with those companies. So, you know, it's, it's a scary thing to do to call, you know, some of these executives up, but um, you will get a great return on that investment of time. And you never know who knows who, right? Like you go, if you called Kent up and said, I want to talk to you about this or that, and through your conversation, you find out he's friends with somebody that you might be interested in pursuing a position with with another company, and he can make that introduction. That's really what um, mentors are for as well. So your professors and different people that you have as mentors while you're here at Chestnut Hill College, I think is crucial that you can make sure you develop those relationships and then they can continue to, to cause I mean, for years I would call back to my professors um, for undergrad and grad for different either referrals or um, introductions or help with applications, things like that. So I think um, those relationships are really valuable. All right, I got two questions. <laughs> Can you do one at a time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so my first question is, were either of y'all in sports in college? I was in um, sports in high school, and I did club um, volleyball and basketball in college. I rode crew. Mm -hmm. I rode crew. Crew? Rowing. Oh, that's what it is. Uh, and then my second question is, how many, uh, how many businesses did y'all try to make that fail? <laughs> Do you want to answer? No, go ahead. <laughs> um, they're, 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 they're different things that we tried. Um, you know, just uh, in, in the company that I was involved with for a couple decades uh, doing non-medical home care, uh, we, we tried doing different things. We tried doing... Uh, a Medicare licensed agency where we would send out nurses and get reimbursed by Medicare. And finding nurses to do that at the time and trying to work with the, the government to get reimbursement on a timely ma manner, you know, back, back a number of years ago was very, very difficult. And it really wasn't what we were expert at. We were expert at the non-medical side with the caregivers, uh, you know, doing non-medical stuff. Um, and we were trying to be all things to all people and that really wasn't the right way to go. Um, we also tried doing something called pop-ins, uh, which again was, was a lot of older people need help with changing a light bulb or you know, doing repairs around the house or they might need a hairdresser or something like that. So we lined up all these different providers to do those services. And it worked for a while, but it was much more time consuming to be able to send somebody out one time to change a light bulb. Uh, it, was much, it was a much better business model to say, okay, we're gonna send a caregiver out who's gonna work 40 hours a week uh, every week uh, taking care of you. So we really didn't find a way to... Potentially change a light bulb. So. Yeah. Um, well, there are things that they couldn't do. But, um, so we, we found that the business model made much more sense to do the recurring, recurring revenue where we could schedule them and, and uh, you know, still keep our rates very low but make it profitable. So, but it was good to experiment. You know, and, and, and we'd try things out. If they didn't work, we stopped doing them. We tried childcare for a while. Um, that's, that's very different market as well. Uh, you're dealing not only with the children, you're dealing with parents who are sometimes very demanding and challenging. Um, so we, we stopped doing that after a couple of years. Um, but I don't regret anything that we, we did try because we learned a lot through those processes and we became better at our core business doing, doing that. Uh, hello and thank you for coming tonight. Um, when hiring others, how much of your decision is a gut feeling about the person versus their listed resume experience? Lori's going to kill me because I'm going to say when she came to interview for her job, uh, we, we spent a number of hours together and, and uh, she put her hand on my knee and she got the job right away. Um, it's, it's not a no. um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a huge believer in resumes because people spend a lot of time putting their resumes together. They get people to advise them. They make a little tiny job sound like it was something much, much bigger. Um, so I, I will, during an interview, drill down 
uh, on those topics. And if I find that the person has exaggerated on, on any one thing, then I have to discount everything else on the, on the resume. Um, I also think that chemistry is an extremely important thing in the business that we did, which was a people, people business. Um, uh, we, we would bring in franchisees to interview, and one of the things I would have them do, I, I had a black and white picture of Lori on my desk, uh, and I would hand it to them, and I'd say, I'm blind, and I've been blind since birth. Please describe this to me. And I'd have some people take it and say, well, it's a black and white picture, it's a, it's a lady, she's got brown hair, and you know, doing this. They're describing what they're seeing. But to me, who's been blind since birth, that has no real relevance to me. I had someone else who took the picture, she looked at it, she closed her eyes, and she answered the entire question with her eyes closed. She said, it's a beautiful woman, and she just exudes this calm about her, and it looks like she's at a party having a good time. She has this smile on her face, just describing the, the feelings behind it. And that, to me, was much more relevant, because you know, the first person I said, well, you say, it looks like she has brown hair. What do you mean by that? And they go, well, she has brown hair. I said, well, I don't know what that means. And they go, oh, oh, you can't see. Um, and we were working with a lot of older clients who, who might not be able to see or might have chronic pain or illness or something. And we wanted our, our people who work with them to be able to put themselves in their shoes and really see the world through their eyes and not try to impose their own values on them. So finding questions that you can ask in an interview that have more relevance just than just, you know, you know, what are your three weaknesses? What are your three strengths? You know, what do you, what, how do you want to improve? Those things really get, get you canned answers. So I like to see people think on their feet, um, see how they respond when they're asked a question that they really won't be able to answer easily. Um, you know, see how they, they uh, under, under pressure, how they respond, um, and just if you like them or not. Um, so I, I do use a lot of gut instinct. Sorry, I have a long answer. Well, and to follow up on that, um, Kent mentioned he interviewed me the weirdest, longest interview I've ever had in my life um, because I was coming in to serve as acting president. That was the role I was interviewing for because he was leaving to write a book. And he started giving me these tests. He gave me this series of four and five digit numbers to add in my head. And I'm like, I told you, I'm not a finance person, I'm policy. And he's like, yeah, but you'll have to do a lot of the you know, finance work. I'm like, okay, but I can use a calculator to do that. And he's like, no. So I added them up in my head and I gave him the answer and I said, okay, did I get it right? And he's like, yes. I'm like, okay. Then he gives me a paragraph that has all these words in it that either started with F or PH and you were supposed to say how many started with an F. Well, when you see a word that starts with a PH, it, you know, it messes with your head and you start thinking, okay. Well, I answered that and I got that right. I'm like, okay, so can we keep going? He did like two or three more of those and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is bizarre. But he was using that to see not only how I reacted and whether I could answer the questions correctly, first of all, but what, how I reacted to some very interesting and different kind of interview tactics because I, was, I think I was in his office for like three hours and I'd flown up from Atlanta, I'd been in LA, and I flew up from Atlanta and I'd been up since like 4 a.m. and my stomach was growling. I'm like, I'm hungry, can we go to lunch now? And then I still had to interview with both his parents and the director of marketing. So it was, you'd look at those experiences and I can remember flying back thinking, oh my gosh, I'm never getting that job. That was completely bizarre. And then he called and I got the job, but no, I'm not done yet. Um, <laughs> And then when he says, um, you know, to trust your gut, well, the other interesting thing is, you know, working in a family business, um, Kent and I shared a lot of responsibilities, but then we also had very different responsibilities. And one situation, um, when I was out on maternity leave with our son, I came back and he'd hired someone for this one position, and then I was going to be supervising them and take, you know, and um, a few weeks in, I'd asked this person to help me with a project, and she said, oh, I still haven't done it, still haven't done it. And a few days before it was due, I said, have you done this project yet? And she said, no. I said, okay, then, we hired you to help me, so if you're not helping me get this project done, it doesn't seem to me like we need you. And she just looked at me, and I said, so, pack up your desk and goodbye. And she's like, you're firing me? I said, yes, I'm firing you. And she, she just looked at me, and so you can have differences of opinion in terms, but the reason I bring this up is because she 
I think could have probably done a good job in that position, but she was not going to do a good job for me. She might have for Kent, but not for me. And I said, you know, that's, that's it. We're not going to deal with that because one of the other philosophies we always had was you can never fire somebody too soon because when you keep someone on in a position that is taking so much time and energy, you have to look at it and say, wait a minute, are you kidding me? There are a lot of people in this world who could be doing this job and probably better, so why am I wasting my time trying to make you fit in when it's not obviously not going to work? So that, I think, for me, um, trusting your gut and making sure, that, and then you know, getting someone who is actually a, a pleasure to work with is high on our list because you work with people a lot and it's a lot of your day, um, so make sure you enjoy it. So, so the, the other lesson from that is it's always good when you are hiring to try to hire people that are smarter than you and have them, have them around you to help out. But um, you know, when we hired Lori, she had her PhD. I only had an MBA. And then we got married, and I was tired of being Mr. and Doctor. So I, I had to go out and get a uh, PhD, too, just so we could be Doctor and Doctor. So. So, so how many here tonight are, are taking HR currently? Did, did what was just said, anything of what your professor's been talking about in class, did it hit home at all? Just asking. Hello. Um, so thinking back to the beginning of your career and everything, what decision did you make that looking back you would have done differently? You know, um, it's a good question, but I, when I think back, I was thinking about this, and some people would probably say, oh, you should have done this differently. But you know, the things that I did all led me to where I am today. So I really don't think I would change anything. When I was, when I was in graduate school, I had the opportunity to um, leave and go to Sweden and work as, on a postdoc. And everybody kept saying, why are you doing this? I mean, why don't you stay in school and get it done? And I said, because I've always wanted to live in Sweden. I'm Swedish, and I wanted to have that opportunity. And so many people, there was only one person who supported that decision, and it was my advisor. And he said, he said OK, if you have a choice, but you're telling me your choice is between staying here, you're going to have your coursework done, staying here and working on your dissertation, or going to Sweden and having that experience. It's like a no-brainer, right? I'm like, well, yeah, but, and he said, just do it. And that was the guy who had the poster on the wall, just do it. So um, from my experience, I, in looking back, I don't think I would change anything. My, <clears throat> I actually wrote some notes on this one, too. My, my answer is a little bit similar to Lori in that after I graduated from college uh, up in Boston, I came back to work with Sun Company here in Philadelphia. And I had grown up pretty much in this area. And I think that I would have liked to have gone to a completely different city or different part of the country just because it's an opportunity to try something new. So Lori going to Sweden, you know, just take those opportunities to do something very different. Um, I also wrote a couple other things down here. Uh, I, I would have watched less TV. And I think today, uh, you know, social media is kind of a, a huge, you know, time sucker. Um, and it, it's a really complete waste, waste of your time. You can be doing so many more things. So I, I, would, have, I would have cut back on that. Um, I said before, I was, I was more concerned with keeping my parents happy than keeping me happy. I was always worried about what they wanted and what they would think, uh, so that influenced my decisions. Um, I would say don't hire relatives or relatives of people you know or work with, um, because if you have to fire them, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, and don't lend money to anybody, uh, and try not to borrow money. I don't know if I'd agree with not hiring a relative, but... Um... <laughs> Well, well we, well, we weren't initially, no. But I think um, my advice was going to be if you do partner with someone for a business, like if you're going to start a business with someone or you're thinking of partnering with someone on a business, just be really careful and, and very clear about the responsibilities that each of you are going to take. Because 
it's really important that you're not doing the same thing because then it turns into more of a competition. If you both have very defined tasks and responsibilities, I think it's much easier and it's much less chance that you're going to have a battle over your partnership or what you're doing in the business. So I've been, oh, right here. <laughs> um, I've been learning a lot from what you guys have been saying. I appreciate really you guys coming here and really taking your time to um, go into depth with these questions. Uh, my question was like, what part of your life did you know, like, yeah, this is, this is my career, like this is what I was supposed to be doing? Well, for me, um, what I was saying before, I was, I, I knew when my grandmother was really important to me and when I was 18, she was put in a nursing home and I went to visit her and she had fallen. And when I came to visit her, she was tied in her chair. She couldn't get out of her chair. And I went to the physician and I said, what are you doing? She's fine. And he's like, well, do you want her to fall again? And I said, no, I don't want her to fall again, but she's tied in her chair. I mean, what kind of a life is she gonna have? And he's like, well, you can't take that risk. What if she falls? And I said, are you kidding me? So that was always in my head. And so then I, you know, I was going to be the doctor that saved the world. But then when I decided not to pre do pre-med, and my grandmother then, um, at that point, had, um, when the doctor told her that, you know, OK, you need to be tied in your chair. And back in those days, physical restraints, she was sitting in a chair, and they tied it behind her chair. So there was no way she could get up and do anything. And um, I think for me, it was, I never wanted anybody else to have to go through that because I saw what happened to her. She basically killed her spirit. She ended up having a stroke and died in a matter of months after that happening. And I thought, you know, that's crazy. And um, just do a little sidebar um, story. When I was at UCLA, I was directing an NIA research project, the National Institute on Aging, and one of our project sites was a nursing home. And we had um, medical students come in to follow us and see what our project was about, and it had to do with reducing physical restraints in nursing homes. And um, I had a lecture the next day, and, and just to say, when we were in this one nursing home, there were a lot of patients who were yelling out for help. And all of these students just kept walking by and not doing anything. So I was noticing that. So the next day when I lectured, I brought in lemonade and cookies and gave all of them all this lemonade and cookies. And then I asked for two volunteers who would be willing to get tied into their chair. Like a, they used to call it a posy restraint. If you're in a wheelchair, they'd tie it behind, behind you so you couldn't get out. And these two guys, who I was so hoping would be volunteers, raised their hands. And I said, great, let me, let me come up. And so I tied the restraint on them. Nowadays, this probably wouldn't happen with human subjects and research. But you know, back in those days, I, I could do that. But um, so I did it. And this is after they drank a lot of lemonade and eaten a lot of cookies. And I was talking, and one of them raised his hand. He said, you know, I need to take a break. I need to go to the restroom. I said, just a minute, let me finish this thought. And I started talking again. Then the other one raised his hand and said, please, I need to get up. And I said, oh, what's wrong? And he's like, I need to use the restroom too. I said, okay, just a minute. So after I talked for a few more minutes, then one of them starts yelling at me. He's like, please let me go. And I said, oh, are you uncomfortable? And he sat there and looked at me, and the other one said, you've got to let us up right now. And so it, you get the point. The point is that these young guys had absolutely no sensitivity to what these older adults were going through, and they had been tied in their chairs, couldn't get up. Most of them needed to go to the restroom. Nobody was paying attention to them. People were just walking by, ignoring them. And I said, how did that make you feel? And one of the guys said, you really pissed me off doing this. And I said, oh, well, maybe you'll be a little more sensitive to someone else's needs and, and situation when you're, and the other one sat there and looked at me and he said, I can't believe I did that yesterday. I can't believe I actually ignored somebody who needed help. And he ended up going on and becoming a geriatrician and working in the field of aging, which was very, you know, it made me happy to see that someone had done, had, had, you know, felt that. But I also think that that situation 
I just remind you that, you know, whatever you're doing in the world, take a moment to think about the other person and the situation they're in because you never know when you could be in that situation and need help too. And I think the philosophy and the caring spirit here at Chestnut College, you're going to get that no matter what class you're in, and especially in business, I think that can be forgotten. Um, we were in a service industry, so taking care of people was our business, but at the same time, you can, you can forget that sometimes because you just you have to keep working at what your business is, but you should never, never lose sight of the individuals that you're, that you're either working with or serving or working to, to um, help in one way or another. And I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> so back to the original question is I knew when I found out when I was working for this nursing corporation when I was, you know, I started in my early 20s, I realized that this is something I wanted to do, but I didn't know exactly what. So that's why the internships and figuring out, okay, I want to try some different things and see really what area I wanted to work in. And so I worked in a lot of different areas in the aging field in healthcare and realized that home care is the one, and so I focused on that. And that is really, um, and I got my dream job with Griswold Home Care because I worked with policy and could actually see results um, from the work that we did in the different states we were in um, and made a difference. Uh, well, thank you for coming out, Lori and Kent, to Chestnut Hill. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I have two questions, one for Kent, one for Lori. Uh, Kent, what is your method of starting a new business in a completely different industry while managing your first business? And for Lori, what is your ways or what would be your advice be when you have two business partners at a disagreement? Good questions. Um, they always say it's a lot easier to get a job when you have a job. Um, so if you're working and you're trying to interview and do something different, it's a lot easier to say, I'm currently doing this, rather than I'm unemployed and looking for a job. Um, but when you're trying to start a new business, one of the big challenges is, is always financial. You just don't have the money to quit your job and devote it to you know, starting a, a business from scratch. So if you can continue your day job and spend your evenings and your weekends um, starting to develop the, the business idea, whatever that might be. And th there's a very important concept if you do start a new business is don't just sit in your room and put all these things together in, in, a, uh, in isolation. You really need to go out, and, and we have this expression, going to the truck stop, because I have a friend who uh, developed this product uh, for truckers, and he got it all developed, and he never went down to the truck stops and talked to the truckers to see if they'd actually use this amazing product. And the bottom line was it wasn't something they wanted to adopt, so all that uh, investment of time and money he put in w was wasted. Uh, so continue to take your product out there, uh, protect the idea, because you don't want somebody stealing your idea, but test it, ask people, you know, would they use this, would they buy this, would they eat this, would they, you know, try doing this, um, so that you're not sitting there making fancy, you know, um, websites or whatever for something that no one's ever going to use. Um, but, you know, just try to get as far along as you can uh, with as, as little resources as possible. Try to do as much yourself so you're not, you know, you know, putting a lot of your family's money or, or your own savings into it uh, too early before you know you've got a good idea there. And if there's a disagreement between two business partners or someone that you're working with, is that the question? Okay. Um, well, from my perspective, it's always important to have a very solid um, open communication with everybody you're working with. And if you don't have that, then you're just setting yourself up for an issue or a problem because um, if you can't talk to your partner, your business partner, about what the issue is, then many times it just gets worse and then there's no resolution. Um, so for, for me, it's really just making sure that you talk through everything as openly and as candidly um, and sometimes brutally honest. Brutal, brutal honesty can be the best approach because you can think that something should be done one way and something they should think should be done another. And that's where I think the division of responsibilities is important. So like Kent with our business, he was, he was and is the finance guru, right? He was in charge of all that. 
whereas policy areas were more mine. So we obviously would discuss a lot of it, um, but I almost, I mean, I defer to him because he's the expert on, on it. And I think that really makes a big difference in terms of how you approach a business and how you decide you're gonna move it forward. And, and you, do, you do need to have a structure in place. If you've got two, two co-owners, each own 50%, and you come to loggerheads, you can't make a decision. You have to have a way to break that, that tie. And, and you know, doing rock, paper, scissors is probably not the best way to do it. Um, so, so sometimes having somebody who's a 51% owner, somebody who's a 49% owner, uh, allows you to do that, or you build a structure kind of along the lines of what Lori says, okay, if it has to do with this area, you know, you get the final say. If it's this area, I get the final say. But you have that, have that documented up front. The other structure that works really well is if you have three partners, because then any two of them can outvote the third one. But having an even 50-50 can be very challenging, especially if it's your brother or sister. And just a funny uh, story to add on, you know, Kent was saying about the interview that he does with the pic, he had the picture of me. Well, what he neglected to say is after people would be in with him and they'd be interviewing with him, my office was right next to his, so they'd walk down the hall and they'd look in and like, oh, that's her. And I'm like, it's not my fault. It's his, it's the picture. It's not me. It's, that's his, and they're like, oh my gosh. All right, so uh, my question was, um, how did you get some of the Eagles players to help you in a wolf pack? Um, we we're, were actually very lucky. My, my partner uh, for the wolf pack was Craig Shoemaker, who's a stand-up comic, lives out in California. I went to elementary school with him. And uh, he's very connected to uh, a lot of organizations, a lot of very famous people, uh, and has good inroads with the Eagles. So the Eagles actually uh, were our, our um, partners in doing the first four episodes we did. Uh, they allowed us to use Lincoln Financial Field uh, to film. We did uh, two of the offers in the locker room and two at the 50-yard line. Uh, we had a, you know, a luxury suite where we uh, did a lot of our openings and so forth. Um, but the, uh, getting, getting Jordan Mailata to work with Gede Gourmet uh, was uh, kind of a lot of luck. Uh, we, we talked to Dave Spadaro, and uh, he had suggested one of the two Aussie players for the Eagles to partner with us since it was an Australian meat pie company. And uh, Mike, who, who started Gaudet Gourmet, an Australian guy, uh, we, we connected him through uh, the company that's actually in, in episode four of our show, um, Pat Waters, uh, who does sports memorabilia and now has a sports agency and is also doing NIL stuff named Image Likeness. Uh, he actually set up a contract with Jordan uh, to um, do a lot of signings, appearances, and so forth. And so we started out paying Jordan to participate for one quarter and Jordan liked the meat pies so much that he just said, I don't, don't pay me anymore, I'll, I'll just work for free. And so he's, he's gone out on the, uh, the food truck and uh, you know, various festivals and, and been serving the pies and uh, he's done a lot of on-air stuff for us. Um, he's actually been out to my house to play pickleball and um, you know, he's really a, a great guy. You know, he's 6'8 and 365 pounds. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a small guy, but he makes me feel like a midget. Um, so uh, that's, that's been really cool. And then, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Brent Selleck uh, from the Eagles, number 87. Uh, he's actually partnered with me and Pat Waters in a project we're doing out in Downingtown. Um, again, met through, through Pat Waters. He's, uh, Brent's actually come out and done a lot of the painting for us and uh, just did the uh, landscaping design for the front of the building that we're putting together out there. There's gonna be a, a broadcast studio uh, you know, for sports uh, out in Downingtown. And just to, just to highlight a little bit um, of those individuals, when we were talking about um, enjoying people, these are the, some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. I mean, Jordan Mailata, like Kent was saying, I mean, he's so intimidating. He's such a big guy, but he is the nicest young man. He's so always like, thank you, Mrs. Griswold. Thank you, Mrs. Griswold. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're, you know, a lineman for the Eagles, but yet that kindness and that willingness to want to help, I think, you know, it's, it's all about the type of person. So you trust your gut and, and um, it, you know, it works out. But it, it goes back to that networking thing. You know, the more people you meet, the more connections you'll start to have with different people. And, uh, you know, you don't want to always be trying to latch on to the famous people, but, you know, sometimes they can be very helpful in, in promoting your endeavors. Um, Dr. Kent, I was wondering if you could provide us with some details about how your investing portfolio has changed as you have become more successful in terms of 
like um, owning less stocks, more maybe dividend stocks, more dividend, I mean, more um, index funds or bonds towards now or later on maybe, I don't know. That is a loaded question. <laughs> um, spe speaking of Jordan Mylotta, I actually spent uh, about an hour and a quarter with uh, Jordan and his then fiance, they're now married, Nikki, uh, doing an Investors 101 uh, with them because you know they're 25, 26 years old uh, and he's come on to a lot of money uh, and a lot of people try to take advantage of folks like that. Um, but I, I've always been uh, a big believer in managed risk and so uh, you know, I, I, I say it's important to take risk but you, know, you, you want to take risks that you can afford to lose. Like if you go down to gamble in, at, uh, you know, in, at the Atlantic, Atlantic City, you know, take $100, say, okay, that's going to be my entertaining money, I'm going to bet. If I lose it, I, you know, I'm, I've spent that money. You, know, you, you don't go down with money and say, okay, I'm going to take $10,000 and you know, spend money you don't have. Um, but as far as actual investing, um, there are two main areas that I really like. I, I love Vanguard. Um, I, I love their low fees, and in particular, I like the uh, dividend uh, stocks. Um, you know, there's a professor down at Wharton uh, who has done all sorts of studies, and over every single 10-year time period um, with the, the dividend stocks and with reinvesting, um, they have always generated in every single period uh, the best return, and they tend to be fairly strong companies supporting the fact that they can issue dividends. Um, the other thing I really like is private equity. Um, the disadvantage to private equity is it's a longer term investment. You know, it's, it's not liquid. Generally, you're invested in seven to 10 year time period, but the returns, you know, anywhere from you know, 15 to 25% annual returns. So if you can afford to invest in longer term, you're gonna get a much better uh, return through, through, you know, if you're investing with the right private equity groups. And I don't like bonds. And I would just like to say um, before I forget to do this, that if any of you ever have questions um, that you think either of us would be able to answer or if you just want to um, get a coffee or lunch or something sometime to you know, pick brains further, um, I just say, especially um, for young women who are going into the world of healthcare, when I, worked, when I started out, there were very few men or very few women in the world of policy because it's basically politics the world that i worked in um, a lot of the offices and so it can be pretty intimidating but i just wanted to make sure that um you know you get our contact information from professors and, and we're happy to do that and having answered your question on my disclaimers i'm not a certified financial planner i can't give you investment advice anything so you have to consult with your legal and tax advisors um, we know you've invented this game called Wall Street. We have three of them to give out as door prizes. Could you tell about the game? Um, this is something I actually initially developed back when I was about 25 years old. Um, came up with a, a prototype and it has sat in my closet for many, many years. And talking about resumes and networking, a member of our church sent me his resume. Uh, he was a Drexel grad in engineering looking for a job. I wasn't hiring any engineers at the time, but in that other, you know, that thing at the end of the resume, it says other facts, he listed that he was an international board gaming champion. So I thought, well, I've got this game. I, you know, I want to do something with it. I think it's good. So I hired him to do development work on it, and he spent about six months uh, working on it, taking it to a number of the tournaments he attended, and he, uh, he used my format and some of the initial rules, but completely improved it uh, to make it a really good, good, fun, and challenging game. It's basically like a strategic version of Monopoly. Uh, you know, Monopoly, you just go around in a circle and you don't really decide much. It's kind of a lot of luck. With this, you actually have to make decisions about where you're going. Uh, it's a lot of budgeting. Uh, there's, uh, you have uh, kind of secret plans that you're trying to accomplish without anybody else figuring it out. Um, but uh, you'll see some similarities to Monopoly, but it's a, it's a much more engaging game. Uh, and so. Uh, I hired this guy, we became partners, I gave him part of the company. Uh, we had this produced, we wanted to do it domestically, but the cost to produce each board was uh, over $60 to produce here. So we had it uh, done in China, uh, still expensive, especially when you add the shipping. Um, but we had a bunch of them done. Uh, we're starting a, uh, a competition at the high school level uh, this coming year. We're gonna have eight different schools sending eight competitors uh, to compete on one Saturday uh, in three rounds of play, and we'll have four winners. We've got uh, um, some significant uh, prizes that we're giving out to the winners of that and hoping that they enjoy it so much that they get their parents to buy them a copy of the board. Uh, we have the second uh, game already in the works. 
Uh, it's a card game, uh, very quick play, 10, 10 minute card game um, that we're just finishing up the artwork and then we'll go into production on that. Um, the other thing that's good about this game compared to Monopoly is Monopoly can go on for hours and hours and hours. Uh, this is basically a 90 minute game, uh, so it does have a kind of a start and finish. Uh, so you don't have to invest your entire day unless it's raining. Uh, you can play multiple versions of it. So that's, uh, it's Zord Games is the name of the company we came up, kind of like uh, sword, ga you know, sword Games and stuff. But, uh, and uh, Wall Street, um, because uh, it's kind of like Wall Street where you're making investment decisions, um, but speed is of the, of the essence. You've got two different areas, one where you can make money and one where you can buy uh, various companies in different industries. You have to decide how long to spend in each, each category uh, and make sure stuff's not purchased before you can have a chance to buy it, especially if it's part of your strategic plan. Oh. <laughs> I have to drive home tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice. Two nothing us. Two nothing? Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.